Well, there you are. This is uh, an unorthodox installment of the Apogee Masterclass. My name is Tony Berg. I am uh, lucky enough to have been asked to uh, participate in this. Clearly the most unorthodox because uh, there is no crowd here tonight. Uh, I am alone with a few people at a safe distance. Given our very strange circumstances, but Apogee's commitment to the idea that we should continue to communicate about what we do and how we make great records. Uh, we're going to do it this way tonight. Uh, I hope it's effective. I hope I don't embarrass myself or Apogee. But most of all, I, I was impressed with the number of questions that were sent in and the caliber of questions because they demonstrated a real love of making music and a real inquisitiveness about methodology. And, you know, what you discover as you speak to producers, uh, each person comes at it with his or her own values and, uh, and style. And what we all share in common, I believe, is a profound love of music and its means of communication because it is, as we all know, invisible. And it gives it a magic quality that none of the other art forms have, in my opinion. So I will answer some questions tonight, uh, but please bear in mind, this is my methodology. This is a, a style I've arrived at after having done this for a really long time. And when I say a long time, a really long time. So let's get right to some questions. Uh, thank you for visiting me in my studio, by the way. Uh, it's called Zeitgeist here at Sound City. Uh, it is the transplanted version of Zeitgeist that was in my backyard for 35 years and has been the first home of innumerable wonderful artists. And I am trying to maintain that tradition here in Zeitgeist 2.0. The first question uh, comes from Tom Cunane from Newburgh, New York. And he asks, what is it that you hear in a new artist that makes you want to take the time to work with him or her and develop his or her sound? How much influence do you have in choosing the direction to take a debut artist? Uh, this is a key question. What I look for first is an original point of view and uh, a voice that is skilled at communicating an idea. So I look for a unique melodic take, uh, a harmonic language, especially a lyric language that separates an artist from everyone else. And, and the, uh, the kind of clear evidence that this person has something to say. You know, I'm not uh, a pop producer. I, I'm not looking to have a quick success with something that is uh, of the moment. I'm drawn to writers. And I've been lucky in the course of my career to have worked with people I consider brilliant writers. It began probably in earnest 30, 33 years ago with Michael Penn, whom I consider a a masterful artist, and then Amy Mann, and Squeeze, and Johnny Rotten, and Bruce Hornsby, and I could go on and on, leading to present day with Andrew Bird, and Phoebe Bridgers, and Ethan Gruska. And, uh, you know, when I heard each of them at the beginning, whether their visions were fully formed or not, there was clearly a spark of greatness something that distinguished each of them from everyone else. So, I guess what I'm looking for is something that inspires me to want to get involved and help that artist realize his or her dream, as corny as that sounds. That's, that's really what this is. So, uh, the, the second half of this is how much influence do I have in choosing the direction to take a debut artist. And this speaks to the heart of what producing records is. 
because ultimately it's not my record. It is the artist's record. And I think that producers often lose sight of that. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that's very telling. If you can listen to something you've produced without thinking, oh, there's that guitar part I played, or, wow, I really did a good job there, or listen to that sound, the moment you can get past that, you're producing records. You're not involved in the vanity business. Because you serve the artist, first and foremost. Now, some artists are more what I would consider entertainers. And they will, by and large, defer to the producer more. But a real artist is not afraid to say, you know, I hear what you're doing and it really doesn't interest me because I'm after something else. And if you are the right kind of producer, you take that on board and you translate that into something that does speak to your artist and for your artist. So, how much influence do I have in direction? Uh, enough, I hope, to ensure that the artist makes his or her best record. The second question comes from Pawil Bryant. When producing new artists on a debut album, are you typically 100% focused on that one album, its potential hits, and its artistic statement, or do you also help the artist visualize his or her career, the long game, and make an album that represents the first setup, uh, or the first step rather, in a musical roadmap for the artist? It's a very good question. Particularly relevant in 2020 and onward, because the record companies are no longer the way they once were, where A&R people typically got involved in the development of an artist. Though there are still those people. I've just finished working with a, a young guy named Chris Morris at Warner's and a guy named Drew Thurlow at Sony. And both of them impressed me for their passion for what they do and the constructiveness of what they had to offer. But that said, it's more the producer's job than ever to get involved in the life of the artist, not just the recording of an artist. And, I mean, practically everyone I work with, I try and offer as much guidance on things like artwork and, and how you interact with your, your audience and venues that are appropriate and bills that are compatible and... Uh, any one of a number of things, along with introducing the artist I'm working with to a community of like-minded artists so as to expand their base and their horizon. So, perhaps because I also manage artists, I get deeply involved in this uh, to the point uh, that an artist might say, okay, that's enough. The next question comes from Stephen Pope. Do you have any useful tips for how to put a nervous or inexperienced musician at ease while recording? A great question. Um, I'll answer by illustrating. Um, years ago, I produced a woman whom I have tremendous regard for, named Edie Brickell, her band, The New Book Emails. And it came time to sing, and Edie was still rather shy. And singing in the studio, facing me behind the glass in the control room, was a little daunting. And I could see that that was the case. So my engineer at the time, uh, an extraordinary woman named Susan Rogers, she and I devised a little, uh, a little shrine to Texas, where Edie was from. And we put all these objects that reminded Edie of her home on the back wall, and Edie sang her entire album with her back to me, <laughs> addressing Texas. <laughs> and that was the right thing to do, because it made her feel good. When Michael Penn did his first album, he also was a rather shy guy at, at that point in his career. And I took the time to show Michael how to use my API console, uh, the equipment I had, and for the most part, Michael sang his debut album 
alone between midnight and six in the morning in my backyard, seated at the console with a microphone right in front of him. And I'd come in in the morning and listen to what he had done. Occasionally when he got excited about something, he'd call me at four in the morning and say, I think you really should come out here and hear what I've done. <laughs> so that stuff happens too. But the broader answer to your question is, your job is to make the artist comfortable and trusting. So what you need to do is listen to your artist and watch your artist and see who that person is and address that person, however that might be. Some artists, strangely, like to be told what to do. Um, then the trick is finding a, a proper way to do it so it can be easily digested. Uh, Chris Steely from uh, Nickel Creek reminded me uh, that when we made the Nickel Creek album that I co-produced with Eric Valentine, a truly brilliant producer, we were working on a song called Doubting, Doubting Thomas. And uh, I'm an atheist. So I heard this song, and Chris had done a vocal take or two, and I got on the talk back and I said, you know, Chris, what if Thomas were right to be doubted? Okay, let's try it again. And I knew that by giving him no time to digest that, he would be slightly off balance when he did his next take. And it was really effective. So you develop a, a bag of tricks, don't you, when you do this. And uh, if you do it well, you get better and better at it. Uh, Murray Pulver asks, how much pre-production do you like to do, if any, and what do you consider pre-production? Well, well, Murray, I am a pre-production fanatic, perhaps to excess, but I think that is really where records get made. When you interact with the artist before the mic is recording. Because it's during that time that you not just really get to know the artist, but you can make suggestions. You can get deep harmonically and lyrically and arrangementally and, and find your keys and tempos, etc. Uh, I'm reminded of when I worked with The Replacements, we were working on a song, and uh, Paul Westerberg, whom I consider really one of our great writers, played me the song, and there was a lyric where he said, I'll tell you what will we do. And I knew what he was doing. He was fucking with, with language. Because he knew that the impact was being felt, but he liked how, it's, how it sounded to misspeak. So I said, you know what you're doing there, right? Well, he said, oh. So that's a moment not just of, of candor, but... There's a nice intimacy between an artist and a producer when things like that happen in pre-production especially. So I'm a big advocate for the, uh, the power of pre-production. Uh, Louis Schifano, hello Louis, asks, any advice for singer-songwriters with unconventional voices? Yes, uh, stay unconventional. Because that is, after all, what we love, right? Uh, or at least it's what I love. I'm not looking for some one American Idol. I'm looking for someone whose voice gets under my skin. And I think that's what the world is looking for. You know, if you scrutinize Mick Jagger's voice, you're not going to say, well, you know, there's Pavarotti and Mick Jagger. But what is it about his voice that made us wild? And why does Billie Eilish's voice make you wild? It is precisely their unconventional nature that excites us and defines who they are. So, don't smooth out the edges, because the edges are the good part. Tyler Cook from Bowling Green, Kentucky, I've never been to Bowling Green, but I love Kentucky, asks, when you're a multi-instrumentalist producer, how would you keep a session moving when you know what part is needed, but the artist seems like they're going to be searching for it forever? but not knowing if the thing uh, they eventually land on could be the magic. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm misreading this because it's a little awkward here. Um, 
Tyler is asking, how do you balance time with the pursuit of what you're after? Well, it's very different today in 2020 than it was when I started because big studios come with big price tags and the clock was omnipresent and you always felt that pressure. Now, there's something good to be said for that because you don't mess around. But that's not my style. My style is, derives from, for 37 years, having my own studio and making sure the artist never felt that the clock was ticking. Some would say that's not healthy. Uh, but it's just my method. And when I started my home studio in 1985, there were maybe seven of us in Los Angeles. And we all knew one another. It was a small fraternity. Now I'm going to guess there are, I don't know, 100,000 home studios in Los Angeles. And that affords a different kind of freedom for everyone involved. The trick is not being so free that you don't get things done. Why, Betty Bennett? It sounded like you had a question for me over there. Do you want some water? I have some water, okay. but I'm going to have some of it as soon as I find where the hell I put it. Gone. All right. I'll get it. Thank you. Uh, you can see how spontaneous this is. Uh, we just kind of put this together an hour ago. But while I have this time and Betty's out of the room, I'm going to say things that embarrass her because I adore her, and I love the company she's built. Uh, she could be the most uh, impressive CEO I've ever met. So, uh, enough of that. And here comes the T-boy, uh, Bob Claremont. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> no complaints, okay, fine. Right. <clears throat> impressive, right? So, let's move on. Uh, Christopher Braun asks a good question. How do you know what sonic environment is best for a song? And do you use reference tracks when selecting an atmosphere? Boy, Christopher, you are hitting right at the heart of uh, one of the key production questions, which is, what are we doing? Right? What are we trying to create here? Is it a document? where you chronicle what's going on at that moment? Are you inventing an atmosphere that you hope 50 years from now people might visit and go, wow, I, I like that trip, I'm going there again. Every artist deserves his or her own environment, in my opinion. Um, that isn't to say a contrived environment or that it's um, a gimmick. Simply, a producer should gauge what's appropriate for the artist and for the songs. And that could be a bone dry setting, it could be drenched in reverb, it could be um, distorted in lo fi, it could be pristine. All of these things should be driven by the artist and what is appropriate. I happen to love that part of the process, the creation of a place. And uh, the other thing, and I don't know why this prompts this, but this is an important thing. Learn from your artists. You will derive as much from them as they will from you. And I can't tell you the times I've noticed something that, that Andrew Bird did, or, or Fiona Apple did, or Phoebe Bridgers did, that so impressed me that I made a note and thought, ah, oh, I'm going to remember that. That's, that's very useful information for me the next time I produce a record. So, be attentive. Uh, Gio Pez, a great name, by the way, says, uh, how important is it, uh, how is it, how important is it building a vision for a debut project? how it's going to sound, what are its references, its main listening targets, uh, its lyric themes. Well, it's everything, isn't it? 
you you uh, obviously you're 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 focused on how this is going to sound. Um, you learn when you produce records that it is a very subtle manipulation, much like filmmaking is, where your choice of an angle can make all the difference in the world. So, as illustrated by our camera woman here, so, uh, you know, maybe doing a, a bridge vocal with a mic 15 feet away brings a different attention to the lyric and affects the listener in a way the listener can't quite articulate but can feel. So every choice you make has has repercussions, you know? So a producer has to always be attentive. Sometimes I'll pull up a record, you know, I think if you're making records in 2020, you need to listen to what Phineas and and, uh, and his sister are doing because they're doing great work. Um, I'll listen to a Mitchell Froome record, a T-Bone Burnett record, a Dr. Dre record, uh, an Arif Martin record, a, Bl a Blake Mills record because they're great producers. I won't listen to it to, to emulate what they've done I'll listen to it to be inspired by what they've done so that I might bring something to the artist I'm working with. Or I might illustrate a point to an artist by saying, listen to what this person did. It's good, right? Let's do better. Okay. Um, Brian Comodi uh, has asked, what are some of the techniques you've used to get the most authentic sound? Well, that's an interesting question because sometimes I don't want an authentic sound. Sometimes I want a sound that doesn't exist in nature. I want to invent a place that no one's ever been to before. But to be, you know, answering your question properly, I would say this. If you have good gear, and you are a good listener, you will be able to do wonderful things. Just listen. Don't do things by rote. Don't look at your screen. Music is not a, a visual medium. Listen. And you will enter the recording in a very unusual way because you have so much control over what people will hear. 2 dB at, at 5K, and suddenly that thing has a different presence. And, uh, you know, get rid of that thing below 40 cycles, 50 cycles, and your room will stop vibrating every time you play a certain part of the song. Listen. And, uh, and you'll get better and better. It's Doc Barron. That's also a great name. Those are two names that don't normally go well together, but they, these do. Uh, what is the most important issue w when interacting with your artist? This is the most important question on this sheet because the key issue is trust. And if you don't develop a trusting relationship with your artist, you're fucked. And the artist is fucked. So what you need to do is demonstrate to the artist that you are listening and that you care and that you identify that artist. You, you see who that person is. Because once you have the artist's trust, your dialogue changes forever. And it's a beautiful thing. It's the thing I look forward to every morning when I come in the studio. Andrew Capra, related to Frank, I wonder. Uh, how deep do you dig in with a debut artist on their songs if you feel they could be improved, especially if they're not used to outside input? Well, um, I'm going to quantify it this way, Andrew. The word is infinity. I dig as deeply as that artist will let me because 
it's my nature. I, uh, I want the artist to be so proud of that recording that 30 years from now, the artist will put that music on and go, I'm really proud of this. I, this is the best work I could do at that time in my life. So I get deeply involved in, in language, in chords, in rhythm, in melody, in sonic palette, in place, you know, um, and in hoping, or I hope I am successful at instilling confidence in the artist. Because making records is a weird thing. You know, ultimately it's a very egocentric exercise. An artist is someone who feels that what he or she has to say should be heard by the world, right? Well, that's, you know, you might look at that and go, wow, that is some deep uh, egocentricity. Or you may go, how lucky are we that those people exist? You know, read Ozymandias by, by Shelley, and you'll, you'll realize Shelley's long dead, as is Ozymandias, but that poem lives hundreds of years later, and that sphinx-like sculpture in Egypt thousands of years later. So art endures like nothing else. Uh, we all, <laughs> you know, shed this mortal coil. So I get as deep as, as I possibly can. Uh, Richard Davis, I know a Richard Davis, but I don't know if it's the same one, says, can you speak to the differences between working with a new artist who is more of an amateur in terms of complete vision and someone who shows up with a guitar and talent. Um, Richard, the, the question confuses me a little, but I think what you might be asking is some artists show up with a bit of a producer head as well, and others are really green. Here's my instrument, here's my song, now what do we do? I'm as drawn to one as I am to the other. And uh, a lot of it has to do with that person's form of artistry. Some people are pure songwriters. No interest in the production process whatsoever. Those are fewer and farther between in 2020 because we're all inundated with production tools. You know, between GarageBand and Pro Tools and Logic and and Ableton, people are making successful records in their bedrooms. Uh, I mean, you're hearing them all day, every day. So, if they're drawn to that, I need to be respectful of that and see how I can integrate what it is they've done into their larger final record. And then there are artists who come in clueless about production but are great writers and singers, and uh, and then we invent something together. Edward Hoxton in London, UK, asks, do I have uh, any interesting, unusual instruments that regularly find their way into your recordings? Edward, really? I mean, I'm sensing you might have some sense of who I am, so I'm just going to assume that that question is a bit of a joke. But I'll answer it by showing you my 200-year-old Citern, or my Roy Rogers guitar, or my miniature Telecaster electric mandolin, or the 500 instruments that are in the other room. Whether it's a Bandura from Ukraine, or a Charango from Bolivia, a Sarod from India, uh, a, uh, an oud from uh, Turkey, I have a nice domra from Russia, I could go on and on, but that would be boring, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, I love the exoticism of instruments outside the narrow realm of rock instruments, and I think they really uh, appeal to people. I think people love to hear something new. Ari Zhang in Taipei City, Taiwan. <laughs> I like how you've started your question, Ari. A&R is the pain in my ass. 
me and my partner are going to release our debut EP. We still haven't figured out the way to show our music to the market. I produce, record, mix my own tracks. Maybe that is a selling point. I really don't know. Advice, please. Well, uh, I'm sorry that A&R is the pain in your ass, because no one wants a pain in his ass. I would say this. If what you're making is great, people are going to respond. Don't let disappointments or frustrations color your love or enthusiasm for what you're doing. Even if it's a small network of friends that you play music for, that expands into an online audience of fans, that expands into a, an international audience of fans, that then prompts a record company to contact you. Make a video, put it online. You know, make your, your music available however you might. Press some seven inches. Do whatever it is to, to get your music heard, if you believe in it. Now, as no time in history, artists are being asked to market their own records. And, you know, it's, uh, it's hard. Because where once you had Michelangelo, you also had Lorenzo. Well, now you have to be both. You have to be the patron and the artist. So, all I can say is, just work hard, man. Don't be deterred. George McCormick in uh, Austin, Texas, asks, I'm about to be a debut artist, I suppose. How do I find a producer to work with? And how do I make a cohesive album? Well, George, the most interesting part of your question is, I'm about to be a debut artist, I suppose. It doesn't sound like you've fully committed to this idea, George. The first answer I have for your question is, Figure it out. Decide if you are. And if you are, pursue it with conviction and zeal. And, and again, don't be deterred. Go for it. Be exacting. Get it to sound the way you want it to sound. Now, how do you find a producer? Play some gigs. Or put some music online. When something is wonderful, people respond. I was driving in my car once, and a local station, KCRW, a really wonderful station, played a demo from a young woman, and I almost drove off the road. I could not believe what I was hearing. Well, I, uh, I did pull off the road, and I called the station, and I said, who is this? And they named a young woman named Jessica Hoop who has figured in my life now for, gosh, over 20 years because she's just so damn great and I could not resist what I heard. So, put it out there. Find ways to get heard. If you, if you hear there's someone who knows someone and you might be able to get your music to the person you ultimately are after via this person, Ask that person if he or she would do you a favor. Don't be shy. This is not a business for shy people. It's a tough fucking life being an artist. So, be sure you have the constitution for it because it requires a lot of perseverance. Um, Jeff Conrad, I know Jeff Conrad, I don't know if it's the same. Hi, Tony. Jeff here. What are you listening to right now, and do you think this is an exciting time to be a producer? Well, I'm going to answer question two first. I think it's the most exciting time to be a producer since I started doing this, and I've been doing this for a very long time. I say that because for the first time since the 60s and early 70s, I feel this confluence of contributing elements making for great art. I'll start with the fact that we are leaving a long, dark tunnel I call American Idol. Uh, I feel like that has finally evaporated from the public consciousness. I'm also feeling artists have something to say. 
And I, I, you know, the first time Phoebe Bridgers came into my studio and played me a couple of songs, you know, I was trying to be cool in response to what I was hearing. But inside, I was going, Jesus fucking Christ. This is greatness. And I'm encountering it over and over. Ethan Gruska, uh, Kane Rashad, Malcolm McRae, Phoebe, uh, Naya Izumi. I'm, I'm just so fortunate to be, to be meeting these debut artists with so much to say. So uh, I think it's a great time. Now I'll get to your first question, which was, what am I listening to right now? Jeff, I'm in this room all day, every day. So what I'm listening to is whoever I'm producing. Uh, I wish I had more free time to listen. Once upon a time, I did. But things are nuts. So let me know what I should be listening to. Chris Maxwell uh, has asked me, what three mistakes, I like the fact that you've narrowed it to three, Chris. What three mistakes can I avoid as an artist trying to fully produce and create simultaneously? What three pitfalls can I avoid to ensure a creatively successful project? Well, since I am a producer, I am going to discourage you, Chris, because I think artists benefit from having the objectivity and the contribution of a trusted ear, a producer. That doesn't mean that person has to be a multi-instrumentalist or a, a, you know, a, a brilliant mixer or a recording engineer, but production can take many forms. You know, one of the great producers of all time is a guy named Lenny Warnker. Now, Lenny doesn't play, and he's not a singer, he's not an engineer, but he's got great taste, and he's a great communicator and he makes artists feel confident. So, maybe you're looking for someone like that. Maybe you're looking for an instrumentalist. I, I don't know, I don't know your music. But if you're gonna do this yourself, what three mistakes can you make? I would say, number one, you can refuse to work with a producer. Number two, refuse to work with a producer. And number three, refuse, right, the old joke. What pitfalls can you avoid if you do do it yourself? Try not to listen with yourself in your own way. Don't marvel at your own playing. Don't, you know, get wrapped up in your guitar part or whatever. Step back, listen to it, and try and gauge what effect it's having on you and what effect it might have on a listener, because that's really what record production is. So those are the questions uh, that have been posed. Uh, I might defer to Betty here. In terms what if of Bob the, joins you, and, to, and, and you guys talk about when you started? Okay, this, the first yeah, this is, uh, I hope it's not uh, a, a kind of detour from what was originally discussed, yeah. but in addition to being uh, one of the titans of the recording business, Bob and Betty are my best friends. <laughs> so it makes for a slightly unusual situation here. We met in 1988 or 9. Somewhere around there. Bob was producing a, a young artist named Charlie Sexton. And there was a co-producer working with Bob at Bearsville in New York. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out initially. Is that what happened? Yeah. Well, so I was told, because I got a call from an A&R person named Michael Goldstone, who said, what chances there you could get on a plane tonight and go to, <laughs> to New York? And I said, the chance is very good. Yeah. And I, I, didn't know about that I went in uh, to Bearsville. I walked in the room. And I had heard Clear Mountain's name for years. Uh, Bob and Betty have heard this story, so it's boring to them, but I had heard that name, and I had always kind of visualized someone like Chief Dan George or a Sitting Bull, you know, what about it. And uh, I walked in, and it was this goofy guy. 
and uh, we had a rocky first couple of hours where I asked a lot of questions that um, elicited very short, brusque responses. And then uh, here we are these many years later, having worked together over and over and socialized, and uh, he and Betty are like no people I've ever known. We became best, best friends, for sure. He was definitely telling his own life. My best friend and friends, and I've just, yeah, after the beginning where I thought he was an asshole, um, I realized this guy's a pretty unbelievably creative guy. Besides, what he never talks about one of the best guitar players I've ever come across. Wow, that, that's very kind. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in a building, and this is a nice kind of parenthetical thing. I have a partner for the last, uh, gosh, 17 years now. Uh, a young guy named Blake Mills, uh, and when I met him when he was 16, I thought, this guy is very, very good, and my sense is he's going to be a lot more than very, very good, and now 17 years later, we're partners in, in uh, a studio, in a lot of projects we've done together, but most important, in a trusting friendship, and this is such a key part of what being a producer can and should be. Here we are, Bob and I, this is 32 years later. And when I know I'm going to see him or get to work with him, I'm excited by that. When I know I'm going to see Blake when I come in in the morning, that thrills me because they're people I have such affection for, but whose work has meant so much to me and continues to mean so much to me. What you want to do is create a community. People you work with, whom you like and admire, because you will get better by virtue of that association. The first time I watched something, uh, Bob makes something, and I had a comment, a, a, a theoretical comment about what I was hearing that was at odds with what Bob had pulled out. I saw little wisps of steam come out of his ears, and I thought, oh, fuck, what have I done? And then Bob went like this, pulled down all the faders, and started over. And I thought, wow, this is a real lesson in humility. Because what he was saying is, my job is to serve the project, not to impose myself. And, you know, all these years later, I think about that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to say something about Tony, that um, at one time, I mean, being a recording engineer in, from the 70s and in the 80s, I thought, you know, well, we all, all engineers so tend to think, oh, eventually I'll become a producer if I keep doing this. <laughs> and um, But then working with people like Somebody like Tony, especially Tony, and somebody like Mitchell Froom, and Don Was, and some of the other incredible people that I work with, but Tony's definitely right up at the top of that heap. I realized I can't do what this guy does. I, I, all these things that he's been talking about tonight, I've been sitting over in the corner listening and, and just soaking it in. Like, I wish I knew how to do that, you know. And uh, and I realized actually I'm pretty good at mixing, and I'm but I'm not. I'm nowhere, I could never be what Tony is as a producer. And uh, it really changed my career. And I, I said, well, this is fine. I, 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 do, I do what I'm good at and what I know how to do. And I'm not going to try to do something that I'm not, that there's other people that are way better at it. And so i got to thank Tony for well, it. <laughs> he gave me career advice without even realizing it. <laughs> and, and the flip side is, uh, the world will be happy to hear that I will never mix a record. <laughs> yeah, do do what you're figure out what you're good at and um, and what you like to do the most and hopefully those two things are the same and do that and don't try to do something that you think you should do just because oh this is what I everybody says I should do you know it just it just do what feels right to you here's a, a, a good and telling anecdote I think uh, a few years ago uh, I produced a debut solo album by Ethan Gruska, a guy whose talent is just 
it, 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 it's, it can't really be assessed. It's so groundless. And, uh, and he said, do you think there's any way in the world Clear Mountain would mix this? And I said, the only way to find out, Ethan, is for us to ask. So we sent it to Bob, and uh, Bob responded really favorably. And Ethan and I were really excited. And uh, the album is a very sparse album. Some songs are just piano and vocal, and maybe a, a wisp of a sound, you know. And uh, there was a song, and Ethan came to me and he said, you know, I know it's beautiful, but it's not how I hear this. Uh, so we went to Bob and said, could we redefine this a little bit? And Bob said, yeah, sure. And then we did that again, and then again, and the number 17, mix 17 is rattling around in my head. <laughs> And that's the mix we use, mix 17. And I'm not saying that you should go to mixers and ask them to do it 17 times, but what I'm saying is that Bob was on the same quest that we were. That's for sure. And, uh, and when we got it, I think the three of us looked at each other as if to say, I can't believe it. This yeah, is great. There it is, yeah. Right. So... There's a there's a very serendipitous nature to, to making records. A lot of time, a lot of times, the mistakes are the, the best thing. Yeah. The moment you just look forward to every time. And if you now go back and listen to your record collection, you, if you listen with a different kind of ear, you will hear things, and you'll think to yourself, "How did this get by? How in the world did nobody say?" You can't do that. And I'm going to give you an example right now. Go listen to Working Class Hero by John Lennon on the Plastic Ono Band. An incredible song on a seminal record. Now, I had heard this th thing a thousand times until one day I listened to it, and it was in the third verse, I think. All of a sudden... The vocal sound and the guitar sound change radically for about four lines, and then they suddenly return to the sound that they had started with. And not only that, but when it comes back to the sound they had started with, they've dropped an eighth note? How had I never noticed that they had edited, edited ed a performance from some other time? right in the middle of the song, on a song that's just guitar and vocal. How did, how has no one ever spoken about that? How and why? Because it doesn't fucking matter, that's why. What matters is that it's a great song and when you hear it, it moves you. So, you know, don't be afraid. This isn't a business for little babies. <laughs>